Hey folks, John here again from A's for Alcoholic. Today's conversation is with Carolyn Ann Anderson. We talked about her early days drinking. We talked about the accident that left her paralyzed. We talked about the overdose that ultimately brought her to AA. We also talked about her being a mother, about being an artist, about understanding where inspiration comes from and how the program of Alcoholics Anonymous has helped her in innumerable ways, not just with uh, alcohol. It was really great to talk to her. I always love talking to sober artists and to find how they navigate creating something new without booze or drugs, which is so often a part of the artist's way. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Carolyn Ann Anderson. I think that's the only flavor I come in. <laughs> yeah, you are absolutely welcome to be as right. inappropriate and um, and as yourself as you want. There's no, there's no limits um, on that, but... I'll try um, to, like, yeah, almost. You guys do talk about your dicks a lot. Like, this I is true. This is <laughs> this is true. Dicks come up quite. They have come like up quite was, a bit in the I past. Was a drinking game, and right? To take a shot for every time. <laughs> you could. I mean, maybe you should do espresso or like uh, soda water yeah. or something. But um, but yeah, Carolyn, thank you so much for. Um, Hello, I'm Carolyn. Yes, for. Uh, <laughs> for agreeing to do this your time i'm glad that we i will remember now that the spring forward is what puts my my time zone and arizona's together not the other way around oh yeah but well, no arizona's on its own thing so it doesn't change so half the year we're mountain and half the year we're standard so you're so, always ahead sometimes two hours ahead, but like <laughs> what no some of some of the year it's one hour and some of it's not or some of the year it's one hour and some of the year it's two hours but huh. I, I have it on my phone now i just like look you know you're a cupertino right so because that comes in everybody's iphone yes yes, yes. cupertino <laughs> i'll just i have <laughs> i don't know where cupertino is exactly but yes that's my that's yes. my time zone that is the thing yep. um so. but yeah so um you know i well, a couple of things, a couple of reasons why I asked you is, um, you know, we've been, we've had lots of chats back and forth online, text messages about literature and books and music. And, you know, obviously you're a big music fan. I am, I am one as well. Uh, we connected on a great many things, literature wise and Steely Dan, which is another yes. big, um, uh, big thing for me, how always has been. Um, but also to find out that you're a sober artist. And that's always intriguing to me because of, and I don't, I don't paint myself, but it's always intriguing to me um, how people perceive art, their own art, their own ability to create uh, when they're, they were in their drinking career and when they're sober and that sort of transition to understanding, understanding it and starting anew sometimes and uh you know evolving is something that's always interesting to me um and i do want to talk about that but i i would like to know what your earliest memories of drinking and or alcoholism are or do you remember My earliest memories um well uh the other thing that i would mention that I, I don't know have you had someone else that was um disabled on the podcast I don't believe so, no. I'm mentioning it because uh, when I got sober, I was like, I'm gonna wait to get a sponsor until I find a woman who's in a wheelchair and she has paraplegia from a spinal cord injury, but it has to be like my level. It can't be like, you know, <laughs> so she has to be a T12 L1 paraplegic. And um, I liked her to have become disabled when she was young. And so I was gonna wait to get a sponsor until I found that specific person. And uh, in my 24 years of sobriety, <laughs> I met one other woman that used a wheelchair and it was at the, the International Convention in Minneapolis and we were waiting for the elevator. <laughs> so I met a couple guys that are paraplegics, but mm -hmm. um, 
So it was, I, I had this woman was like, you know what? Why don't I be your temporary sponsor until you find that woman? And uh, 24 years later, <laughs> she's still my temporary Nice, <laughs> nice. Because I just never met him. And so um, I just mentioned it because you probably can't, be, I don't know if you can tell, I'm, I use a wheelchair. Mm-hmm. And uh, it would have been really, really helpful for me uh, to know there was somebody else out there. So you know? this is, yes. And now that you mention it, and now that it comes to uh, uh, Whitney from Sober Rabbit. That's right. And... I, I, we actually connected. because yeah. So, but I don't like to out people because some people like publicly identify as being disabled. Mm-hmm. And then some people are like, oh, you know, I'm this I just have. So, yeah. Well, we, we we went into it for uh, her our their whole story uh, in length, uh, but yes, yes. So I have, um, and you are correct. It is a it is an important thing. I I you know I think when we we're trying to find a, a sponsor, I mean I would always just tell people just go do it. You know I think the 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 advice that I got that sounded best was you don't have to marry the guy, just get it, you know, and if you, if you, if you hate him, then find somebody else, but just do it, yeah. you know? <laughs> it, the, the, what I got was stick with the women and find somebody who has what you want mm-hmm. and it's not their husband. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yes. It's not their husband. So if they have a job and a family and, you know, the things that you see yourself wanting in life, like, mm-hmm. like go talk to them and figure out how they did it. And, um, and that was really, really good advice too when I picked out a sponsor. So I picked out a sponsor that had a job, a career more than a job, but that mm-hmm. she loved and kids and a family because I didn't have all that stuff and I wanted it. Yeah. So where do you think this all started? Not like, you know, or where, oh, what was your earliest was memories? Yeah. Well, you know, there's kind of two, this is only, I've, I've kind of put together with long time and sobriety. There seems to be like, people that are just alcoholics because they just are that way they're just came out that way and they're just wired that way and then there's a lot of people in AA that I think alcohol became a way of self-medicating trauma and uh and I think there's a lot of people that's like the Venn diagram of you know those two things meeting and so I don't know um I don't know if I I was just always destined to be destined destined to be an alcoholic um I like to um I really wasn't into drinking so much before um I, I was uh, uh let me let me go back let me rewind <laughs> so um when I was 17 I was in a SUV rollover accident and I was paralyzed and uh before that I I kind of lost uh, I had a, I had a bad head injury so I kind of lost the two years before and I don't really remember so much and so I know more about that time period of life from my friends telling me, oh my God, remember when you, you know, <laughs> and so there's some pretty crazy stories of like stuff I did when I was like fucked up. And uh, so I definitely looked like I was going that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I also uh, had this really, you know, really bad car accident. I was thrown from the vehicle. The truck landed on me three times. It's amazing that I'm even here. Um, and I was hospitalized for um, five months, six months. And, uh, and it, it was, uh, so I, I was 17 and they, they put you in this like body cast thing and you're on this bed that moves constantly. And um, you can imagine like, like a rabbit on a spit, <laughs> a rotisserie thing, you know? So I was in this, this cause you're not supposed to get bed sores. So it has to right. constant, constantly move. And I probably was in about the worst pain a human could, you know, be alive and still be in. And um, I was hooked up to this machine that, you know, every seven minutes you could hit it and get morphine or fentanyl or, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. the mix they were giving me. Um, And man, I, 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 for years afterwards, I could still still tell exactly when seven minutes was because (laughs) it was like a little rabbit condition to hit the thing. um, And I was in like the most blissed out. So here I am in this like, you know, like medieval torture kind of thing. And, and I was just like, oh my God, this is like the happiest place I've ever been in my life. Cause I was so, you know, and I don't know when you're 17 years old, if you have that for months and months, what that does to it, a teenager's brain. So like, I, I don't know if, 
uh, if that was, you know, part of it or, you know, mm. it, and it doesn't really matter in either way. I just mention it because I think there are a lot of people that have trauma that are in AA. And I'm, I feel really, really fortunate that my sponsor was my sponsor and not a trauma therapist and said, as soon as I got sober and I got my brain together a little bit, she's like, you probably need to get some outside help for this. And I couldn't, I don't know if the outside help would have been effective when I wasn't sober. And, um, and I just want to share that it's my, it's my experience, strength and hope that once I got sober and then I got some outside help for the trauma therapy that it got a lot better, it, like it really got a lot better. And so, um, so yeah, so that's kind of my early, um, my early memories. I had, um, I do you want me to go more on that? <laughs> well, no, I mean, I'm just curious to, so did you, did you continue drinking after? Well, I got out of the hospital and, uh, I, uh, let's see, I had to go home and go back to, to high school, mm -hmm. which was really hard. Cause it was like a little rural town in in Wisconsin. And I was the weird art kid. Anyhow, <laughs> so it was the weird art kid, you know, the body cast and the, you know, so it wasn't like a really like a uh, fun time to go back to school. And then, then I went to college right away afterwards. And I, I, uh, uh, back then there weren't a lot of wheelchair accessible colleges. Mm. And so I was going to go to a school in Minneapolis and with the snow and, you know, so I moved to Arizona. So I, I kind of left my entire support unit, family, everything moved across the country where I didn't know anybody and uh, really, really enjoyed college. Um, well, I don't know about the class part of college, but I, you know, I really like enjoyed partying and drinking and, um, and, and that was kind of my, uh, you know, and I don't know if it was any more than other college kids, um, but there was like one point, uh, I, I kind of fell for my professor mm. who was in his forties and uh, I was hanging out with him and then, uh, and he was a drug addict and uh, he was like, oh, hey, do you want to try heroin? And I was like, oh no, I don't, I like, I, I really hate needles and I was in the hospital and, you know, and he's like, oh, <laughs> needles, you can just smoke it. You don't have to you know, shoot it up or anything. <clears throat> and so um, I remember the very first time I smoked heroin and, you know, the chase on the dragon thing, and I got it in my lungs and it was like instantly I was transported back to that magical place on my rotisserie spit in my, in my little cocoon where like everything felt good and wonderful. And oh, I was like, this is it. And I pretty much didn't hardly left that room for the next six months and just became a junkie. So um, that's kind of the point where <laughs> it went from like college partying to hanging out with this 40 year old uh, professor guy. <laughs> smoking heroin, yeah. <laughs> smoking heroin and, uh, and then I overdosed. And, uh, and that, that's a whole really gnarly story but the bottom line was that I I had a friend that I was I had met when I was 18 mm -hmm. and we had gone we were partying friends in college and uh he had gotten sober through AA about a year before me and he, in fact he said he couldn't hang out with me anymore because I was too crazy um and he had heard I overdosed and called me and said, Hey, do you want to go to an AA meeting with me? And I was like, well, I don't really know if I'm an alcoholic, you know? Um, and so he took me to an NA meeting and the very first meeting I went to, it wasn't wheelchair accessible. And it was before they like noted them in the meeting schedule. Mm -hmm. And I got there and it was upstairs and you know how it is like hard enough to get to your first meeting when you're like, Oh, I feel okay. I'm willing to do this. So I got there and I was like, Oh, okay. It's just not meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll leave and so there are these two other junkie guys there and they're like no 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 we're gonna get you there so they carried me up two flights of stairs and this other guy was like probably just as new as I was and he was like shaking the whole time and I was like holy shit I'm gonna get dropped down two flights of stairs <laughs> so and then I got in the meeting and they left my chair at the bottom of the stairs and I was you know so they put me down on this couch it was like in some like therapy office somewhere 
And um, I was like, shit, I can't get out of here. You know, I don't know if anybody else has those, like, I like to sit in the back of the room with my back right. to the wall so I can see the door. So I was on a couch and there was no way for me to get out at all. And so, um, so that was my first meeting was, <laughs> and then afterwards what? I got to get carried back down the stairs. Damn. Wow. wow. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I, unfortunately that, that's when I came in the program and I've been out ever since. Well, so was that, and you don't have to go into any detail, you don't want to, but was there something in the, I mean, an overdose sounds already traumatic enough to get somebody to change their mind and change their life. We both know that doesn't always happen. It doesn't yeah. often happen, right? Was there something in the, in the overdose? Did you, what was the, like the epiphany in that moment? The moment was, so, uh, <laughs> There was this guy uh, when I was in rehab, not re not uh, spinal cord injury rehab, that was an orderly, and he was like right out of a like a, a, a Charles Bukowski book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's like the guy that like you know helps you uh, you know, take you. Know, so he he used to he taught me how to like gamble with dice, and you know we, well, he was like my buddy like right in the okay, and uh, he would read me books. <laughs> And so I would like trade him my lunch for books or, or like back then they give you like a whole little muffin cup full of pills. And I'd be like, oh, here, take whatever you want. <laughs> and so he was kind of this like, uh, like he would read me his books that he wanted to read me. And they were like, you know, what, William S. Burroughs, Naked Lunch, you know? <laughs> uh, the, the Trout Fishing in America, like those kind of like yeah. books, um, not like the best teen book club. <laughs> and of course being a, a teenage girl on her own for like I you know instantly fell in love with him and um so I think he became like the template for you know future loves or whatever mm -hmm. and so when I I met this professor that I was with he looked like Tom Waits and sounded like Tom Waits and uh you know from that beatnik mm -hmm. kind of age you know uh -huh. and um, and oh my God, like I thought I was going to be his wife and I was going to write my memoirs of being a professor's wife. And it was, you know, <laughs> it was just going to be this magical, you know, relationship. And uh, it didn't matter about the age difference. And so when I was at his house uh, and I was overdosing, I'm like, I, I need to go. Well, I need to go to the hospital. Like I could feel, feel my heart, all the stuff that, you know, happens. Mm -hmm. And and he was like, uh, he, he walked me out to the car and he put me in the driver's seat. And I was like, where are you going to drive me? <laughs> you know, and he's like, you're not going to die at my house. And he slammed the door and walked away and was just like, I, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with you overdosing. And that was the moment where I were like everything, you know, and then the whole bunch of other stuff happened that evening that um, it, it got even crazier. But uh this person that i thought was the one was just like did not want to deal with the legality of taking me to the hospital or having me die at his house and just was like you're on your own kid and walked away and that 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 was the other piece besides the physical um medical aspect of it was the mm -hmm. well wait a second maybe i've made up this whole <laughs> thing in my head that really isn't reality and and that was that was like the other crash you know of, yeah of bottoming out was that so <clears throat> so and he wasn't I... Tom Bates he just didn't <laughs> he just like didn't couldn't buy a suit that fit him right but you know, <laughs> right you know, like, iron things <laughs> I think that's most of us that think we're Tom Waits at some point in our lives. We just uh, yeah. we've got a bad suit and we're yeah, really goofy depressed. Hats. Yeah. <laughs> I went through a breakup in like 2006 and there was a period at the bar that I was working at. And every single night I had like all 14 albums on a shuffle and I played them all and I lit up all these candles and I turned the lights down low in the bar. It was like a seance. It was so dark in there and it was a very miserable place to be. Um, but it was, I don't know if it was cathartic. Or it was, even, oh you know. God. But I just thought it was so tragic and poetic and, you know, but um, so, so NA is your first meeting. I know yes. you as somebody who's in AA. Um, now, how does one go from 
overdosing NA on heroin, NA, and you said, maybe I'm not an alcoholic, but you, you have since changed your yeah, mind on so that. So the guy that took me to my first meeting um, was a AAA guy. And uh, he, you know, and this is, I guess, you know, 20 mm-hmm. years ago, um, NA wasn't as solid everywhere. It was kind of a newer program. And, you know, some cities had better chapters than others. And uh, he said, you know, why don't you come check out AA? Because there's more meetings. You might be able to find more wheelchair accessible meetings because there was only a handful of NA meetings. And, you know, they met at different places and there was a ton of AA meetings. And um, and his home group was one of the, the wheelchair accessible meetings. And so I... I went with him to that group and that's where I met my sponsor and uh and it just it just was a more organized there was more there was more long-term sobriety there and there was more women in sobriety there and so um it only took me about a month or so to realize oh it's it's the same steps it's the same you know everything and you know in the beginning I used to introduce myself as an addict I'm you know I'm Carolyn I'm an addict um and you know the old timers would be like, well, you know, this is this is an alcohol <laughs> program. Now it's different, or because it's you know it's, the whole culture's kind of changed. But um, but you know, within a month of being there, I was like, I'm Carolyn. I'm an alcoholic. Grateful to be here. Grateful to be sober. So yeah. um, so mm-hmm. it, it 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 wasn't. Uh, I could see in my own life that it didn't really matter what it was if it was alcohol or right. or drugs or you know relation like whatever it was all it was all things that I was addictively using and the steps could be equally applied to all of them that was something too that was kind of a interesting epiphany for me early in sobriety is going oh this stuff could be used for anything and I would I would run into people and I would talk to people and people I was friends with and you know um other other people that I worked with. And I'm like, my God, this person could use to go through the steps, you know, like, yeah. geez, Hey, you know, that's a, that's a resentment there that you are uh, that's eating away at you. And, and mostly it was just me <clears throat> being annoyed with people <laughs> and, yeah. you know, but, but I really do think it's true that there is some, there's some use in the program for kind of anything that might be bothering you you can replace the word alcohol with whatever i mean you can replace the word god with whatever you want right so because that's that's kind of a sticking point for a lot of folks well and once i think you work the steps and you get some some relief from working the steps when you're like oh you know what didn't take away everything but god i you know i I don't feel like killing myself anymore i don't feel like you know like you realize (laughs) that uh, like I remember the first time my sponsor said, you know, maybe you need to do a four step on your accident and like the medical institution and in health insurance. Cause I had a resentment with my health insurance, you know, or whatever it was like, you can do that. You know, like, I know it says, you know, people, places and institutions or whatever, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, in the beginning you start to see how other people could all benefit from the steps. And then as you get more sober, you realize all the things in your life you, that could benefit from the steps and you start applying it to yourself. But yeah, there's a lot of things that, um, that you, can, you can step your mm-hmm. way through. And, and, but, it's, but it's like that first initial, like you're, like you're desperate enough when you're hurting and bottoming out that you'll do it for alcohol, that you see it works then, you know, then you can start, Yeah. oh, well, maybe I'll work on this or. Right, know. right. And then I've also learned to leave other people alone with their resentments, right? It's yeah. like, it's none of or my business. The other dishes. thing that happens is if you work the steps, the other people around you get better. Like that's something that's really amazing <laughs> that happened to me. Like Wait a I'm going to have to cut them out of my life. Yeah. And then yeah. I do the steps and I'm like, oh, you know what? Maybe they're not that bad. You know, right. maybe some <laughs> Maybe some of this was me. <laughs> yes, my perception of the uh, of the right reality was incorrect. Um, <clears throat> so you say you got you went through it, and you 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 never turned back. Um, how and it just it just clicked right away. Was there some resistance, or did you just go like, "This is my new life"? I think um, <clears throat> the 
the medical part of the overdose was such, I knew I would die. I didn't have another one in me. I didn't have mm -hmm. enough health that, uh, you know, they, we, I'm, I'm in really good health now. Um, but, you know, a spinal cord injury, like it, it, like when you have a spinal cord injury, you, there's a neurological response you get from drinking called autonomic dysreflexia that I just like ignored. Like, <laughs> you know, if we get a bottle of medication that it would say, do not drink alcohol while taking this medication. And I'd be like, I'm supposed to take this every day. Like, <laughs> How am I not supposed to drink? I'm going to take that drug. You know, so I had like a, I had a urologist once that was like, you know, if you don't take this drug, you're going to die before you're 23. And I was like, it's got a big sticker on it that says you can't, you know, you can't drink alcohol. It's a flatter drug. What's, you know, we're not going to take that. And so, um, like, I, I realized how close to death I was and that I, if I, I just knew that if I went out again or used again or even drank again, I, I, I would be dead and so was, that was enough what was the phrase Neur, uh, autonomic reflex. autonomic auto, it's, it's auto dysreflexia or autonomic dysreflexia it's called okay. it, it it it's it happens um it's like a it's like a safety system if you're paralyzed so like if you we're sitting in your chair and somebody stuck a knife in your leg and you can't feel it like you need to know you so your body will start sending off these signals like you know, you're in pain, you know, so your blood pressure will go up and you'll start sweating and you get a really bad headache. And it's, it's dangerous because you can go into shock from it. Mm -hmm. So it's like your body's way of saying something, something's not right. But if you drink too much alcohol, it sets it off too, because it's your body's way of saying, Hey, somebody's putting poison in your body. <laughs> like, what's going on? <clears throat> wow. <clears throat> and so, um, but I, I wasn't self-aware enough to know you know, I was just like, man, why did I get a really bad headache from that? Or why did I, you know, why am I sweating all of a sudden? And so, um, got it. And that's why, and that's probably why I prefer drugs to more, you know, in that, that time period. Cause like, uh, and the other thing that's really interesting too, is like in that, that I had a, a really bad brain injury and I, I used a lot of LSD probably there's probably like a year, <laughs> maybe like three years where, I mean, just regular LSD use. And now there's a lot of research to that like with brain injuries and LSD. And so it's, it's uh, it kind of resets your, your brain or whatever. And mm -hmm. so I was always more into uh, drinking, into drugs more than drinking because I got that response from drinking. But um, by the time I, I uh, got to my bottom, like I knew like, like I wasn't gonna, I had doctors telling me that I wasn't gonna live to 23 if I didn't, you know, change. Right. <clears throat> and so the physical aspect was there. You were like, I can't do this anymore. Um, and, and AA just made sense yeah. to you pretty yeah, early it means, on. It made, well, and I was really lucky that I had this friend, uh, that had gotten sober and, uh, and he was very sweet. He waited till I had a, a year of sobriety <laughs> and then we got married. <laughs> So did Very the, nice. did the, that's proper did the AA thing. like we got a year he's like i can't date you till you have a year and then you know uh like three weeks after we started dating oh let's get married <laughs> so and so it was it was really nice because you know for uh i had, I had a great home group with a great group of young people uh, which not everybody has depending on where mm -hmm. you live um and uh there's a lot of like parties and ASCII PA or, you know, like the young people in association, each, mm -hmm. each has its state. So it's like in California, it's, uh, I can't remember what it is, but it, Arizona, it's ASCII PA. And they'd had like roundups and different speaker things. And um, it was nice because I was part of an AA couple. So we would do the speaker circuit or do the, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was also in Al-Anon and, uh, it's sometimes harder to get Al-Anon speakers for things. And so as a couple, like he would be the AA speaker and I would be the Al-Anon speaker. And it was, it was really wonderful. It was like a really, like, I um, didn't have any family here. I didn't really know anybody right. in Arizona. And I was, uh, let's see, I got sober when I was 22. So pretty young. Wow. And yeah. so I had like these moms, I had these, <laughs> like these older sober ladies that were like moms or aunts to me. And uh, yeah, so I, I just kind of got into a groove and uh, thankfully, thank God, I've never, you know, drank or used since then. Why so. did you go to Al-Anon? What was Why the- Why did I go to Al-Anon? Well, one, because I was dating somebody in AA and they were okay. like, you go to Al-Anon. 
<laughs> you're nuts. <laughs> this isn't going to work. And also, um, I definitely recognized uh, some behaviors in me that were, you know, screaming codependency. And yeah. Uh, and it was also the home group I was in. It was it was encouraged if you were in a couple that you you went to Al Anon and and I really I'm really really grateful because uh, as my I'm I'm no no longer with the that guy uh, but as that as our relationship changed I was so glad I had so many years of Al Anon to like help me you know to to keep my side of the street clean and to make sure that I wasn't doing things that were, uh, you know, contributing and uh, to have someone like I, I, I not in the last year, I've done all the steps over again in Al-Anon and in Al-Anon, they have this thing called a blueprint for progress, which is like a, you know, a writing and oh my God, if, if you are an AA and you have this uh, like, oh no, Al-Anon, you know, because <laughs> I didn't uh it like don't like go it's so good there's so much so that, there's so I can't, much yeah somebody gave me one of these and i i swear i wish i could remember who now but i have it on my shelf and it's the blueprint booklet yeah yeah right so apparently somebody thought i should i needed it um but yeah i i just <laughs> I remember going, yeah, somebody's like, this is really great. You could use this. I think it was sort of like, they gave it to, oh, I remember now who it was. Uh, they kind of just gave it to me. One of these, one of these old biker guys out of his truck. And, you know, we met for coffee and, and he's like, well, I got this, you, you know, this might be good for something, something, whatever, and blah, blah, blah. And I don't think he meant it. Like he didn't say it was directly for me, but obviously he wanted me to have it. But, um, yeah, I'll pull it out and check it out. I just remember the oh. only time I've ever walked into an Al-Anon meeting and I was at the, I was at an Alano club I'd never been to and I was lost in lots of weird little rooms, you know, and I walk into one and this woman just walks up to me as I'm going in there and she's like, something like, sweetie, I think you're in the wrong room. The AA is down the hall. Uh -huh. Like she knew on my face that I did not belong there. Like she could tell that I was the lost alcoholic. She You're down there with the smokers. Face. See the yeah. smokers down there? The guys on the motorcycles. Like, oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, but so so you 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 join AA, you're on the, the speaker circuit and and life is perfect, right? I mean, this is but you know what? I, I have to say that my life got so good, like um considering where I was and mm -hmm. considering that uh like I went to college, I got my degree, I went to graduate school, I got graduate degrees, um, I worked for the university, I had two wonderful children, you know, and uh, like, uh, and I got very busy, you know, and uh, yeah, life was really, really good. Like, I, I mean, like promises, just <laughs> like lots wow. and lots of promises. And um, yeah, and it was really, it, it was really wonderful. So I, I didn't see any reason to, to change it. <laughs> no, I mean, that's great. I, I love it. I love hearing that. I don't, I don't hear it that often. Yeah. And so, I mean, no, I'm not saying that I, I don't hear it a lot, but I don't, I don't, there's always, yeah. there often feels like for me, even, you know, I'm six years on and there's been issues and problems and, and again, I should probably get another sponsor and go through the steps again, right? This was another yeah. suggestion that was made to me. They were the guy was like, "Yeah, I got 19 years. My new sponsor's only got three. We're just going through the steps again." And I was like, "Oh, I didn't know you could do that." Oh yeah, you know, there's 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 some people that are very like, well, once you got it done, you're done. Like that's it. I did my steps. I did my four yeah. steps. I'm done. And um, my sponsor was very much like. Well, you get, if you don't do it right this time, you'll get it right the next time. And I was like, the next time, nice. what? Um, and so, uh, like, I went to, well, I got the scholarship <clears throat> from the university to go study in Berkeley, uh, like, when I was, like, six months sober. And I was, mm -hmm. everyone says, don't make any big changes your first year or whatever. And, um, and they, 
the kind of the experience, strength, and hope around me that I got was like, this is the once in a lifetime opportunity, go. And so I got to Berkeley and I called central office there and I was like, well, I think I might need to go to a meeting sometime in the next couple of weeks. I don't know where. And the girl that answered the phone was like, I'll be by at five to pick you up. <laughs> and so like my first year at sobriety was half in Berkeley and it was uh, like super exciting because there was like movie stars at, at meetings and um, like it was so different from like I grew up in this little town in northern Wisconsin and Arizona mm -hmm. and so it was just you know Berkeley was so different uh, than uh, there so I had worked the steps for the first time with her and then when I came back to Arizona my temporary sponsor <laughs> of 20 years right <laughs> was like okay well why don't you kind of go over it again with me so that you know so then I did a second one with her and then I just got in the habit about like every four or five years and the blueprint for progress is also another way to it, it's the same steps you could just you don't have to do an Al-Anon you could use it just to do your AA step right. work because it's different it's you know if you're if you've done the same columns over and over and you're just like oh god you know I'm gonna write this guy my first boss and it's you know <laughs> you're gonna do that all over again it's just like a different a different way of same same thing with like uh there's a lot of forms online like from from hazelton or you know whatever that are like the worksheets that you can yeah. do sometimes those are really really useful for you know looking at it in a different way than just the columns in the in the row so yeah i got in the habit of doing it and i'm like i i mean and i had like i i, I quit working at the university because i got um I was I was in the crosswalk crossing the street and somebody hit me with a car and Jesus. um yeah <laughs> and, and I hadn't gotten therapy for PTSD yet because it really I mean in 1991 that was like we kind of knew about PTSD but not you know sure. like and I kind of thought well I wasn't uh my father-in-law had served in Vietnam and like like Vietnam veterans had PTSD. I mean, like I had a bad day. They had like, you know, so I didn't really feel like I had the right to have PTSD mm. because I just mm -hmm. had like one thing happen to me. Right. Um, but, but that experience brought up all my PTSD and it got to the point where I, I couldn't drive anymore. And so um, it was like, oh, maybe I need to get some therapy for this. And I was so grateful that I had the steps and that I had this language you know and so it's like the peeling of the onion like first I had to get sober and then I had to get my health stabilized and then I had to get you know then I, then I got married and I had to learn how to be in a relationship and then you know so like uh so so crappy stuff has happened to me but you know during the, uh, the my drug log isn't very long because I didn't drink very long I've been sober you know half my life so my sober life <laughs> part's probably more interesting and, and longer than my right my drinking part but uh but it but it, it is a really great way to look at life because I don't know if I would have taken advantage of therapy or I don't know if I would have taken advantage of you know um like I had a therapist that said hey you know what why don't you try uh try meditation for chronic pain why don't you try that and see how it works and I was like well I don't know anything about meditation she's like well you know here's some buddhist groups that meet why don't you you know they're meeting at the ywca and it's free and you know i, I don't know if i would have done that if i would, wasn't sober like go hang out with a bunch of buddhists and try to figure out how to meditate you know because when i got to that the the steps and they were like you know through prayer and meditation like i i my my father was a minister in this little town i grew up as a preacher's mm -hmm. kid but like i knew everything i was like a pro <laughs> prayer and bible stuff like i got you know, all that down but like none of that kept me sober so i was like hmm well if the prayer stuff didn't work maybe i should try meditation and um i didn't know i didn't know how to meditate at all like i had like my meditations were like uh controlled worrying or you know like <laughs> yes. extended winning the lottery fantasies you know like i would sit still and <laughs> mm -hmm. my brain would start going about you know like oh what what would it be like if I was in a band, you know, like just <laughs> whatever random stuff. And so yeah. uh, I took class, I took like classes with a bunch of Buddhists on how to, you know, do meditation and, and wow, that really helped. But I don't know if, if I hadn't been sober, if I would have been like, oh, like if I'm going to explore this option, maybe I should take some classes in it or read a book about it or go to a workshop. And, and so, 
I can't imagine. I feel the same way. I mean, I don't think that any of a lot of the things that I have done to help myself or to enrich my life, I certainly would not have done while I was drinking. Absolutely yeah. not. Absolutely not. That would, it wasn't even in the periphery of things that were available, let alone. It, it, the only reason it would be in my vocabulary is if I was making fun of somebody else doing it. Like, right. Oh, exactly. They're, they're joiners. <laughs> right. <laughs> You fucking you know, loser, you stupid snarky, idiot. Yeah. Um, snarky little comment about them. Yeah, they mm -hmm. don't want to hang out with us anymore because they're off, you know, so this is, gazing. <laughs> so know? this is very interesting to me that your 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 sober life now has taken up far more time than your drinking because you started you, so young, right? You got yeah, sober yeah. so young. And I I don't often talk to people who have the kind of time that you have and are as young as you are. Um, so it kind of, I'm curious as to how you saw yourself. You know, I, I mentioned something at the beginning of the, the, the show about being a, an artist who uses and drinks and then being an artist who's sober. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, you were very young at the time, but did you, how did you perceive yourself as a young drinking, using artist versus how you look at it now? Um, well, I wasn't an artist before. I had just okay. been an artist like in, in high school and I applied to art school and I, my parents were very much like, uh, how are you going to have health insurance? Like you need to go to college and get a job that will pay the bills, which I, I mean, I have a master's degree in Marxist baloney. Like, <laughs> Marxist bullshit. <laughs> like, you know, my dad, that didn't go to school. I think <laughs> like, nice. so I don't know. Like getting a degree didn't really like you know help me uh, get a better job. But I, that was the general consensus of the world that like oh do do art in your free time and right. Uh, but the art I did do uh, before then, like in high school and and such, was very much. I I think I I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get real drugs because <laughs> I lived in this little tiny town. Mm. Like I couldn't wait to try LSD and see if I could paint on it and see, mm. you know, like what I was going to get out of it. And, um, and so I do, I think I very much thought the creativity process was somehow linked to drug use and alcohol, and it was going to open up this well of ideas for me. And I was going to, you know, but then in reality, what happened was I just got so fucked up. I couldn't hold a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> you know about that <laughs> huh? really crappy art and uh mm. and i've had a lot of really great um like mentoring other artists and such i've had a lot of really great conversation about like there there is this you know i don't i don't know what you want to call it like a collective uh place ideas come from you know and sometimes talk like artists talk about like there's like an antenna you put out in the world and you you're mm -hmm. able to, to get some of that or maybe you channel it through you. And I think, you know, uh, for a lot of people, alcohol or drugs, like opens, like opens that up a little bit. You, like you have a little bit of an experience where you can dip down in the well and get ideas, but, uh, or they can remember high, like, just like we have like great euphoric highs that are really great, but we don't remember all the other highs where, you know, you ended up getting kicked out of a bar and, and barfing in the, <laughs> Yes. A cab on the way home but you don't mm -hmm. think you just remember the oh yeah that was a really great high and so uh there's the, the same thing with artists like oh i got really high that time and i got this great idea but it there, it's really hard to like find the just right mix between being open to ideas and then not being so fucked up you can't create or make anything or you know have it together so your personal life doesn't fall apart and um and so it there was some of that relearning you mm -hmm. know how to do that sober and it's it's a really interesting i think i think it's a really difficult thing for artists um in sobriety and not in sobriety of how to like where do ideas come from where does creativity come from and i mean i don't i don't think there's any argument that drug and alcohol makes it easier for some people because if it didn't we wouldn't have all these artists die at a very young age because it's it i mean it it's true it, it does come from there but like how do you do that sober and how do you do that and and i i think 
as I got more serious about studying Buddhism and I got better at meditation and I got more disciplined about that, I was able to recreate that um, without any drugs or alcohol, but it took work. It didn't just happen, you know? Right. And so, but it, it is, I, I think a lot of artists, when they get sober, go through almost like a grieving process of losing that because there are moments where it works perfectly. It's just, you know, it's just like a moving target to hit that, that perfect, that perfect mix mm. without dying. <laughs> well, without dying, right? You're always, you start, you start counting drinks and, you know, yeah. dosage. Like, oh, yeah. like, I, like I did this mix of, you know, Coke and drinking and, and man, it was really, really productive. Can I hit that mark again? But it, it's a moving target. It changes. And so yeah, it's, it's interesting. It, it's interesting to talk because most of my artistic life, um, I, I, I left my job at the university when I had the car accident um, in 2002. And then I started doing art more full time and, and uh, had kind of a second career doing mm -hmm. that. And, uh, and, and I, I, I've been part of this group of artists in town that are all in recovery, which is been was really really helpful for me to have a mentor that was sober and um especially like when we had shows together because there wasn't any out, like everybody has the same you know freak outs about shows and stuff and so it was really nice to have all like people in recovery around me yeah and it's <clears throat> for me writing is far more rewarding now than it ever was before um, I still get frustrated. I still get stalled out. I still, um, you know, get dissatisfied with things. All of those same complaints that I might have had um, when I was drinking are still there. But I, I see a way through the problems in whatever mm -hmm. I'm trying to create. I see a way through the obstacles. I whereas before I used to have this thing where I would sit down. And I would get loaded and smoke a bunch of cigarettes in the living room. And I would type on usually like my laptop if I didn't have the typewriter it was a long time ago, but, um, and <clears throat> I would just let it rip. And if I was lucky, I would get one good piece of a poem and the hangover would be worth it. And that mm -hmm. was my, my measure of success. <laughs> right. And now yes. I'm like, yes. okay. Well, you've got these three pages and let's be honest, really, you got, this is, this doesn't make any sense And this. And so there's more work to it, but it's more rewarding, I think for me. And I, I don't know if, if you feel the same way or like you talked but about I, meditation being work, or you have to put work in to find yeah. the source. And, and I think that uh, what happened when I wasn't using drinking for creativity was it, it took away the delusion that um, a lot of us have that, that uh, making art like just happens, you know, that like, like there's a prodigy and you, you know, you sit down and like every pianist that, you know, every musician, like, like the, the Malcolm Gladwell quote that, you know, anybody that does something that we all appreciate at a high level put in uh, 10,000 hours of, of mm -hmm. practicing, you know, like for five or six years, they, they worked at it for, uh, you know, four or five hours a day, they practiced their craft, and they had to put those five or six years in, and then you become Miles Davis, or, you know, like, all, like all everybody had to do that, unless you were a prodigy, and even prodigies put in a heck of a lot of time practicing. But I think when you're drinking, it's, it's this idea that, oh, you know, I'm going to like take a bunch of speed and be like Kerouac and I'm just going to, you know, like kick out 40 pages on a roll of toilet paper. And, you know, like that doesn't happen for um, like th that's like a very rare thing. But when we're in our alcoholic mindset, I think we we get this romanticized idea that just it's addict. I mean, it's just as addictive as like, oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get high and I'm going to write song lyrics to the best song you know <laughs> and when you so, are when you're yeah. sober like you're like oh that's ridiculous and so what happened to me was when i was sober i started putting that time in and it just yeah. like every day like every day i paint every day every day like and you know for every good painting there's three 
horrible, awful paintings that, and, and I try to I, like, cause I have some people that I mentor and stuff. I try to post the horrible ones because, you know, we're uh, Instagram, I think makes it so that we're constantly comparing our worst stuff with somebody else's highlight reel. Mm. And, you know, it's like so easy to be like, man, I suck. Look at, you know, this and look at theirs. And so like every artist for every like great thing they've ever done, there's a lot of like really awful art. <laughs> and so for every writer <laughs> that, you know, there's some really awful first drafts and bad, yeah. you know, it, it, and, but, but when you're sober, that delusion that you're just gonna, you know, on the road it out. It, it, yeah. <laughs> And didn't Kerouac's was, liver burst out at like 46? He died. Yeah. Then. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, he didn't make it very far. Yeah. Most of them don't, you know, and like, yeah, this was the 37, the 37 or 27 club. 27. Like 27. Yeah. 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 I mean, Bukowski lived until he was like in his seventies, but he didn't seem very happy to me. And he, I don't like he probably put every day. He probably, you know, like he's pretty prolific. He right. Put a lot of time in. He did. You know? He did put a lot of time in. So, I mean, and this is, this is another theory I have about him is that I don't know that he drank as much as he said he did because he had to have been writing to be so prolific. And I think a lot of it was, well, I know now that a lot of it was bullshit, at least to me, like I believed it as this life that I could live and I tried yeah. very hard and I, 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 I had the perfect little Bukowski bungalow and I drank excessively and I smoked excessively and I tried to write excessively and that didn't work. But, you know, and I have like all these old drunken poems and I want to kind of put them in a book one day and call it like Bukowski lied or something. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I feel like he had to have not drank as much as he did to be as prolific as he did. But don't you, know? you think that's a persona that he made? Like, I do because like because I'm I'm pretty introverted and <clears throat> it, like for me to show art and to show up for things it's almost like I have to have like a, a different artist persona you mm -hmm. know like <laughs> like Instagram me <laughs> right yeah <laughs> are very different people but um but that helped me because like I'm when I when I would um, like a lot of times that shows people come up they're like oh you're so inspirational and I can see them start to cry and they want to hug me and I'm not a hugger so like I'm like ah and I my uh, my sponsor's husband told me once uh, that selling art is uh, ninety five percent the work and ninety five percent the packaging mm -hmm. and you my dear are the packaging and you know the reason somebody buys a piece of art from this person or another person it's because they know something about the story about the other person like there's museums full of great the museum basements are full of great art but you know people want to see van gogh because they you know they know the story of van gogh and i was like oh man how am i going to do that because i like don't like to put myself out there and i don't want to mm -hmm. market myself um, and so i had to kind of create a persona and i think almost all artists do that just this kind of like a self-preservation thing, if not yeah. like a, or not, if not like they told totally me get into it, like, like, uh, like, you know, Tom Waits goes through like different phases where he, you know, he's like kind of the Sinatra guy with the little hat or the, mm -hmm. like, he was like, he was like a, an old man when he was, he hasn't aged because he was an old man when he was in his twenties. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I think Bogowski did that. I think that was like his, like, I'm a drunk guy persona. Like that mm -hmm. was his. You know. I always felt that, right? I always felt that about him. And, you know, and it was, uh, I still loved it. I, I bought into it. <clears throat> all but of that. Yes, it's all romantic. It's all like, I mean, that's why women love Bukowski, even though he's such a misogynist, you know, like whatever, because he's, he's the tragic drunk guy that we all know, you know? So I think, maybe I think not he all would women have... love Bukowski. <laughs> I think he would have liked AA. I think he would have liked having a captive audience to listen to him talk. Have you ever <clears throat> but... read Nick Toshes? Have you read? Who is it? Nick Toshes. Nick Toshes. No. He uh, he's you should read him. He's he's one of my favorite. But he has a he has a book called The Devil and Me about AA and his he's a writer and he kind of has a, a a persona like Bukowski 
it's like the drinking he used mm-hmm. to write for uh pre magazine and and rolling stone he was like a music writer mm-hmm. and then he wrote some really great like thriller novels and then some a lot of like really great music writing so but Nick he's kind Tentious. of like I, I put him in 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 like my Bukowski yeah he's he's a favorite but 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 one of his books is really a lot about his his experience with AA and like trying to figure out who he was within it and mm. um he didn't he didn't end up sticking with AA but um you know <laughs> yeah I mean it's 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 there's so many other challenges in life and sometimes people are not up to it or they have they get overwhelmed or any number of thing. And like you said, finding outside help, right. Knowing yeah. that this, yeah. knowing that this program is not the, um, we don't have a monopoly on it. You know, like there's no monopoly on the big book, but I, I, that's one thing I, 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 when I was newly sober, I was very zealous and I thought everybody needed AA and everyone in my family needed to go to AA. And, Oh, you know, when I was like, a, like I swallowed the big book and spit it out at people. And I'm sure it was completely annoying and, you know, <laughs> right. difficult to be around. And then the longer I get, the longer I've been, the more I've been like, yeah, you know, if I'm here, if you want to, you want, if, you know, like everybody's doing sober January and now it's February. So like I'm seeing all these posts that like, oh, that was great that I did my, you know, or, or the California sober thing. Mm-hmm everyone's smoking pot and I'm like yeah I did I there was a stage I did the marijuana maintenance diet you know before I got sober and I thought oh yeah I'll be sober and I'll smoke pot but uh <clears throat> like I'm here if you want to get sober but I, like I don't know like there's a lot of things that work for people and and that's and, fine and like knock yourself out um I I don't know the whole the the, the more I do it the more I realize I don't have I don't know anything <laughs> I don't know anything except for I got sober and my life got better. I haven't almost died of an overdose. I haven't crashed any vehicles. I haven't, you know, I, my, my car insurance is paid. My little sticker tabs are up to date. Uh, You know, like my kids, thank God I have teenagers. They've never seen me drink. They've never, you know, experienced, uh, like, like I, I went to, I saw Lou Reed in Minneapolis, one of the best concerts I ever went to, uh, Although I only remember the first half and the second half, I woke up in an upstairs apartment in St. Paul, Minnesota, Mm -hmm. and I didn't live in St. Paul. (laughs) And I was like, huh, where's my chair? (laughs) You know, I, I, uh, it was in somebody's trunk. It it, Mm -hmm. it was like this whole thing, but like, since I've gotten sober, I haven't lost my wheelchair. I haven't woken up in a place and gone wait, how, how, and how did I get upstairs? Right, yeah. <laughs> All these questions. I'm trying to recreate the evening. And that hasn't happened to me since I've gotten sober. And that's that's good enough for me. That is, I'm, I'm totally good with, uh, e- even if my life is boring and, and, you know, nothing exciting happens from here on out. Like, I don't have the bad stuff. Yeah, and, not, not, not having the bad stuff. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's fine, right? We talk, we talk a lot about, about finding contentment and however you find that. And again, I don't, I don't judge anyone who is sober in any way, shape or form and however they want to call it and whatever they use or don't use or do like who cares, right? If you're living a successful, happy life full of contentment, then keep doing that. Mm -hmm. It's working. Right. So yeah, I just know that for me, I, c- I couldn't imagine drinking or smoking or any of that stuff ever again, you know, and I, and I, I'm not above the idea that a relapse couldn't come, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, and I think like uh, one thing, I think anybody who survives trauma or if you have a death happen in your life, when you're really young, like you have this moment where you realize anything can happen, like anything. Like, uh, and you're never safe. Those are like the two things I think you get out of having a traumatic accident happen to you or have someone, you know, close to you die is that this can happen at any time and you're never safe from it. And, um, and I think the, the switch that flipped for me when I got into recovery is that was true. And that's just the way life is. But also if anything can happen to you, why does it have to be bad? Like, why does it have to be a horrible thing? Like if there's a one in a million chance you'll be in a car accident and 
break your back, why isn't there one in a million chance you'll become the next, you know, whatever your dream is or whatever. And the odds are the same, but the alcoholic mindset made it all about horrible stuff that was going to happen. And then the sober mindset, I could see slowly happen all of a sudden it was like, oh, and and you start taking, instead of taking like stupid risks, (laughs) you start taking like great risks, like, oh, maybe I'll write a book. Maybe I'll submit this to a magazine. Maybe I'll, I'll, I think like I just put some uh, art in an upcoming group show, like Mm -hmm. things that I I wouldn't, I don't think I would have had the audacity to do. Like, like, who are, who are you to think somebody wants to spend a couple thousand dollars on a painting? Like, how dare you ask, you know, like I, uh, but but somehow I was able to use that trauma thing in the opposite direction yeah and it and it makes life so much more exciting you know it makes it more if you're not waiting for the shoe to drop the other all the time you know that's that's awesome um that's you know I think that's a good place to to end the conversation I love that idea anything can happen so why can't it be good um I would only ask if somebody's listening and they're contemplating sobriety and they're not entirely sure, what would you suggest to them? And I know we're not ones to give out advice, but from our own experience, perhaps something can be gleaned. Um, What would you, what might you say to somebody? Try it for 30 days. You can always get your, you can have all the misery back. If it doesn't work, you know, like, like, give it give it like i think i think like that's kind of the medical standpoint now i think Mm -hmm. you know is is try abstinence for 30 days and then reassess but uh that's when i when i have uh people ask me about it or if they want to go to a meeting you know or whatever like just give give it a try for 30 days and like what you you can always go back you know you can always you can always change your mind and say, oh, you know what? This isn't for me. It's not a lifetime, you know, it, for, for us, it's like a 24 hour deal, but like anybody, you can, you can always try it and you don't have to tell the world or put it on your Instagram that you're doing a sober, you know, January, just like, you know, just, just see how it is. See if you feel any better. And, I'll do a, uh, do a sober February. It's only 28 days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, and, uh, and what, whatever, whatever led you to this point, I mean, you can, you can always have that back. (laughs) You can always have it back. I mean, just for health reasons alone. I mean, like people feel better, you feel better, you know? So. Yeah. I don't think I want any of that back. I I can't imagine a day so bad that I would want to, you know, spend my mornings. Oh my gosh. We had had COVID go through in January and uh, <clears throat> I was like, I, it's like I had, I had a mem- memory of what a hangover was like, or, you know, just like what my, well, just w- when you're in it, you don't realize how horrible you feel, you know, yeah. or how, and then I was like, oh yeah, like, it's really weird when you have a hangover and you haven't drank, <laughs> you have that feeling, you know, where you're like, you're all like dehydrated mm-hmm. and just awful and mm-hmm. and and like that COVID experience reminded me I'm like oh man I used to feel like this all the time you know like smoke too many cigarettes and you can't breathe and you're like <gasps> you know like <clears throat> and uh it, it was a good reminder I'm like oh I can I can have this again <laughs> I can have this, <laughs> this all is always <laughs> available it is right there <clears throat> so yeah being square is not so bad no not at all it's, uh, it's a good life it is a good life. Well, Carolyn, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And it was great to, to get to know you a little bit more. I still have the book I will be reading um, after oh, mine. Yeah. Right and now, I'm reading. Nick Tosh is to your, I hope I'm saying his, his last name right, but How he's a really, it? he's not, and anybody else listening, I'm just warning you, he's, it's not for, it's kind of like in the William S. Burroughs category <laughs> of, of, of not, you know. <laughs> pg-13 no probably r what's the restricted r <laughs> dark and dirty dark and dirty and uh um, a little bit challenging or not not a not a feminist in any way whatsoever 
<laughs> but his music writing is hilarious and it's it's great so um which is not a prerequisite for good literature and good writing necessarily obviously we know yeah. that through the bukowski but um but yeah uh yeah i have the book you gave me uh what is it oh yeah the um tom jones tom you sent jones. me tom tom jones is wonderful because he got sober he he was and he's he's like a character in a bukowski book he was a janitor he worked at a like a, a mail room like all the mm -hmm. he was in the marines and and the the thing i really like about tom jones is he had a head injury and then went on to become like an insanely talented good writer which like gives me a lot of hope that like oh you know there's life after a head injury and and so he's more hopeful he's a he's yeah. like a great hopeful <clears throat> like a, a guy that got sober and wrote some just mind-blowing short stories so well after i read this book about childhood trauma once i'm done with that i'm going to go into something uh you know a little more the fiction and so i kind of try to trade it off where i go like self-help non-fiction and then i i do something that might be a little more enjoyable fun, right? Yes, yeah, like, exactly. Like, a, like a, a reward. It's like the ice, the bowl of ice cream after mm -hmm. your school work done. So. Exactly. Well, <laughs> Carolyn, thank you so much, and uh, I will uh, I will talk to you soon. Yes. Yep. Thanks again for listening. Our music, as always, is by Neglect. You can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com. And you can find us on all social media platforms that matter: Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us at a is for alcoholic at gmail.com. Talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs>